Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Jim Hamblin of If Our Bodies Could Talk. Um, thank you for those of you who've stuck around. I know it's been a really long morning, and I and I and I think we're going to make it worth your while. For our last session, uh, Chef in the City. Uh, the timing's perfect because uh, I think a lot of us are getting hungry. I'm delighted to introduce one of DC's rising food stars, Chef Eric Bruner Yang. He serves creative food to a city that's not exactly known for its creativity. Uh, at his restaurants, Toki Underground and Maketo, and he's here with my colleague, Atlantic uh, editor Corby Kummer, who is uh, quite a food man himself. Welcome, Corby. Thank you, Margaret. Wow. So we actually have a demo today, which is very, very rare, and you know, it's actually an Atlantic first. I don't think we've ever had a food demo before. So you're here for an exciting moment. Um, and I was asking Eric about why ramen, and it turns out that. He grew up in Taipei till he was four, came, and he was mentioning the strong music connection. So tell us again how you got into food and where music comes in. So, um, you know, when I, when I was 15, I, well, still, like, I, hate, I just hate being told what to do. So my mom was always like, uh, you can't do that, uh, you can't afford it, whatever. And I was like, great, I'm just going to get a job. And so my first job was making caramel popcorn at the mall at Potomac Mills. And that's when I really fell in love with working in restaurants. And, but also at the same time, I was uh, really passionate about music. So playing music really allowed me, um, and working in restaurants, really gave me the flexibility to kind of live the double life of, you know, having, having a way to make money, but still having the flexibility to play music. And, but after uh, my music career um, kind of stopped happening, I just kind of really fully transitioned to restaurants. Uh, we don't want to get in the way of your of your telling us black steel pan. By the way, everybody is. Do you all have black steel pans? May I get a spoon? Maybe incredibly, spoons? incredibly lightweight, incredibly flexible, holds heat really well. You'll see this in chefs' kitchens much more than you see copper. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's practically as good. It's really cheap. Did you bring this? No, this is from Teddy. Really? Yep. Okay, this is a well used. Seasoned. This is a well-seasoned black steel pan. Uh, and when you were deciding you were going to be cooking ramen and making food that you'd seen in Taipei, you know, how did you learn to do this with uh, what you can find here? And we were talking a little bit before about sourcing ingredients, which all morning has been a huge theme. Sustainability, where do ingredients come from? What are the priorities? So what were your priorities? And, and then tell us something about the, the lids you're opening and what's inside. We don't have a mirror here, so you're gonna have to you know, hold it up. We don't, we don't have the mirror, and we, but we do have a spoon. Thank you. Um, so when we opened Toki Underground, I was already living in HG. I opened, helped open up the sticky rice there in 2006. And I just really fell in love with that particular neighborhood of Washington, D.C. It was really small. Everyone knew their name. And we were all kind of out there as pioneers, whether we were neighbors or business owners. And um, I learned how to cook ramen in Taipei when my grandfather was passing away. So I would spend time in the mornings in the hospitals, and I would work at night at the ramen shop. And then when we came back, I was just like, uh, had this real passion to open this restaurant. And mostly because every great neighborhood, to me, should have a great noodle shop um, as a place that they go to have a sense of comfort, whether it's a solo experience or it's something that brings a whole group of people together. That's all I ever intended Toki Underground to be. It was just a place for locals in that area to just go and have a nice meal. Um, at You know, it was this, a, a, a bursting of ideas because it was my first restaurant, so we just threw everything that we thought was cool up, um, and then people just happened to think it was interesting. So keep going. They're, they're less um, so, our, so our new restaurant uh, that we also opened up on H Street, um, you know, for me, part of sustainability is about building community, and that's why um, Wendell Berry, everybody, the great agricultural philosopher, would say exactly the same thing. It has just come out of Eric's mouth spontaneously. Absolutely, sustainability is community. So how do you try to build a community where good, Tokyo huh? Underground is? <laughs> well, it smells fermented is what it smells. That's right. You know, um, fermenting is the name of the game now in, among all chefs. Ferment everything yourself, don't that's buy That's right, it. we're saving it because we don't want to, because we're cheap. Mm. Oh, um, it's because you're I'm innovative and you're going back to old ways and it's so much more helpful and you're, you're doing your own homemade probiotics. That's right. Um, so, you know, 
we decided, we intentionally decided to build Maketo on H Street because we wanted to create a place of public space, a place in, in our area where people could just go and, and do nothing, have a place to go and do nothing. Um, but we have to obviously have a business model, so we built a restaurant, a little coffee shop, and a little retail store as an homage to what H Street was in the late 60s before all of it burned down and during the riots. Um, our particular focus is uh, traditional Taiwanese food and Cambodian food. My wife happens to be Cambodian. And so this dish is a dish that I fell in love the first time we went to the Cambodian temple in Silver Spring, Maryland. And this is a dish you serve monks on the holiday. So this dish is called Prahuk Kati, and it kind of encapsulates what Cambodian cooking is all in one dish. But there's something very significant about what he said. He discovered it not in Cambodia, but at a Cambodian temple in Silver Spring. And it shows you that the, bringing the cuisine of the globe right to where you are, the sources are myriad right where you are. So you found this dish right around here. Correct. You just, if you explore communities within where you are, you can bring to light a whole world of flavors that uh, your local residents and your neighbors might not know about. Okay, what are these things you're putting in that I would call pork and lard and uh, a hot sauce? Uh, so first we put a, wrong, uh, sure. a ground pork mixture that we fermented with sticky rice and garlic. Mm -hmm. um, the traditional name is Sike Krok. It's kind of, when you see pictures of um, Southeast Asian, you see the sausage hanging from outside. This is kind of that. Um, and this is a red curry paste. Um, that we make. Cambodians use the word krung. Krung is the word of curry paste in Khmer. Um, what's really cool is the Mid-Atlantic um, really mirrors a lot of agriculture in Southeast Asia. So you can, you can, you have access to all of the same ingredients here in the Mid-Atlantic as you would in Southeast Asia, just at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and so curry paste is made out of turmeric, garlic. You're smelling this, ginger. right? I'm not the only one who's smelling it. It's coming, it's coming through. You're all Shallots, getting it. Shallots, um, galangal, and kefir lime leaf. All things that you can grow here, um, which is what this is actually all made from um, a farmer called Next Step Produce that we buy his stuff at DuPont Circle. Okay, so you go to the DuPont Circle farmer's market like every enlightened Washington chef. But yes. how often can you do that and how much of your ingredients can you afford and the logistics of just going and schlepping it back to your restaurant, right? I mean, how often can you do that? Uh, well, Heinz is a, a, a wonderfully stubborn man, and he makes us come to him. Um, so that's why we all go to DuPont Circle. Uh -huh. um, but there's a lot of farmers that do just deliver to you. And so we just have to, we make the stuff, and we, you have to do a lot of fermenting. You have to do a lot of freezing um, for things if you want it, or canning, and for things that you want to last all year long. One of, the, uh, one of the main seasonings in Cambodian food, which is why this dish is called prahuk ati, is the actual thing called prahuk, which is fish sauce, fermented fish before it's been pressed into fish sauce. And Cambodians don't really use fish sauce, they use this seasoning called prahuk, and we've made our own prahuk um, from snakehead, which is very similar to Mekong River or fish that you get in, out of the Mekong River. But where do you get snakehead? Out of the Potomac River. <laughs> This is so great. You know, there's lots of celebrity chefs right around here who will go in and find scuppernongs or you know, native fruits that still grow wild here that you never think to order. And here is, here is stuff, including galangal, which I had no idea grew around here. Yep. Can you get local galangal? Yeah, Heinz grows it. This is just unbelievable. So have you, how many people here have bought or cooked with galangal? which is an absolutely essential component of Thai cuisine. And I generally go to Asian markets to try to find it. That's right. But you can go to Heinz at, at, at DuPont Circle. So Newt Nuak Mom, this is like the chief ingredient in many, many restaurants. Yes. Is it a big thing for you? Uh, we use it as a substitute because this takes like a month or two. And then we do have a lot of dishes that aren't kind of like classically Cambodian, but we wanted to bring it to let you know that you don't have to invest in making your own stinky fish paste at your house. <laughs> and it's more than suitable just to use. The and it's stuff. more than enough for about a year. This would last us a day. That would last you a yeah. day. This wow. plus 12. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you get into Cambodian food, you'll be using, but it's not just Cambodian, it's Vietnamese. Vietnamese, Southeast Chinese, Asia, French even, just some classic French Southeast dishes. Southeast Asia. Yeah. 
Nuak Mam is like soy sauce now. You have to have Nuak Mam fermented fish sauce in your house. Allergies? Um, no. Okay. You see, I mean, you're all going to get to taste this, right? Are, you, are they all going to get to taste this? Yeah, I have some. Plenty. All right. Um, I get pepper, salt, and then this very complex tang of a fermented flavor at the end. So there's salt and heat at the beginning, I would say. Yeah. But then it's the ferment and the tang. And that's what you get when you build a sauce with oil, the shallots in it, and the various herbs. It blooms in the mouth. And it's, um, it's a tang that only ferment gives you. And fermented food is the basis of all chic cuisine right now. So every chef is fermenting everything. So you'll see like jars of pickles and eggplant and onions and vegetables and sauces and tomato sauce that they all put by because they've gone to the farmer's market, bought in bulk. Did you all love field run seconds that we were hearing from Michelle Nishan today? That's something we should all be going to at the end of the season, which is essentially now. And fermenting, I wrote, I wrote a piece about canning tomatoes for the Atlantic about going at the very end, mopping up big crates of incredibly cheap produce and making your own. Do you do that? Yep. Because the, the impediment for restaurants is they don't have storage space. Correct. Do you have storage space? Can you put stuff by and use it in the winter? Uh, we pick and choose what we really focus on. So the main things that we focus on preserving are the essential uh, curry paste ingredients. From there, we just kind of do what we can to get through the, the seasons where we can't do anything. Tokyo Underground has no walk-in or no freezer, so we get the deliveries fresh every day, and we start from scratch. Now, was that a money thing, or was that to say, we're going to emphasize freshness, and this is the way it's done in Taipei. This is the way I've seen it. It's fresh, fresh, fresh. We're not going to freeze. Or was it storage space and money? Um, I think it's a combination of both. One, we just didn't know we would be so busy. And two, um, that's just how the rest of the world operates, you know, like they cook what they can cook and when they can't cook anymore, the day's over. You know, there's no pressure to um, cook for 300 people or 400 people. It's just cooking with what you're capable of cooking with and then, um, you know, calling it a day. By the way, that is a great, you, you, you're just spouting philosophy right here. So that <laughs> is a great philosophy to live by. Cook with what you have till it's finished and then end. So, but is the recipe over? Is that is that the base of your sauce? That's it. Okay, so I see cucumbers, I see... So, um, as you see, we didn't really use a lot of meat. And so in modern Cambodia, there's just not a lot of land for grazing of animals. Most beef, most pork, most of those types of, you know, uh, besides chickens and ducks are coming from Vietnam or Thailand where they just have more ability for animals to graze. Most of this is because of what the Khmer Rouge di did to the land there. Um, so um, they um, really focus on eating a lot of raw vegetables because this is something that they can control. Um, and they eat, what they eat with a lot of rice. So this dish is about a lot of flavor with minimum amount of protein. And you really just kind of eat it like a chips and dip kind of situation. Which you will all come up and do in the communal dipping phase. That's right. Um, but can we talk pork? Yep. Because when we're talking ramen and ramen broth, I recently had the good luck of going to Japan for the first time and it was, of course, ramen obsessed because you have to be. But the broth, the complexity of the broth, it was like pure pork and also, frankly, pure emulsified pork fat. So where do you get your pork? Um, have you changed where you source it from? And like, how do you get that, build that concentration of flavor in your broth? <clears throat> Um, you know, one of the challenges that anyone cooking some sense of Asian food at a high level always has to, has to put out is that for us to cook our dish as well, it costs a lot of money and it, uses, and it requires a lot of ingredients. People will pay $15 for, you know, Italian foot long sub and it's fine with them. Um, but when you throw... Would you pay $15 for a foot long sub? You guys do at Taylor all the time fine after with tax. It. Okay. Just throwing that out there. I can, all right, fine, fine. Um, you know, and then when it's, a, when it's something that has this perceived thing as cheap, which is what ramen is perceived as in America, um, how do you talk about what it takes to make it? And so for our soup, um, it requires three main proteins. It requires a lot of pork, it requires a lot of chicken, and it requires a lot of fresh fish. Um, and that's how you make the stock. 
Um, at any point in time, we'll, do, we'll get delivered 100 to 150 pounds of pork bones a day. We go through 450 green circle acres chickens a week. And um, we go through small, you know, maybe about 100 small local line caught fish that you just kind of use to make soup with um, a week. And that's just expensive right off the bat. Um, but when you say line caught, I presume that because you're not selling it with the name of the fish, you're able to buy lower cost. Yeah, we just fish. buy like bait, you know. But like that takes an army of you know, f you know, five to ten people just focused on making soups instead of just ordering your bread and your cold cut and your cheese and your lettuce and tomato. And this is something that we develop all week for 24 hours. You really mean you have five to ten people making soup? Yeah, all day. So how many people on your line? Toki runs six people a shift, lunch and dinner. And so that's 12, 12 people for six days, double service. And you are in the soup business, well, I am essentially. Soup and where do the noodles come from? The noodles are made by a Chinese family in Springfield, Virginia. So again, local community. So the Cambodian Temple in Silver Spring, how did you find this family? Uh, they make almost all of the lo mein that you know in Chinese carryouts everywhere. And so they stop twice a week to make our noodle, which is just a flour and white noodle. Custom noodle. Custom so I think we all, we, all have to go, we all have to go and get it. OK, so Q&A, uh, have we got any questions? Except like, how can I not wait in line for your ramen? OK, right there. Um, so you said that you started uh, Toki Underground because you wanted to have a neighborhood noodle shop. Um, since then, it's obviously like gone gangbusters, and there are huge lines everywhere. Um, that, I think, can sometimes create a, a barrier to entry yeah. in that respect. Um, did it achieve what you wanted to achieve in having a neighborhood noodle shop, or do you wish it were even more accessible? Or um, You know, a restaurant's going to have many different life cycles. Um, and at some point in time, it's going to be what we intended it to be, because we won't always be the most popular. Um, and then it will just end up being what we want it to be, which is where people just come and do those things. Right now, we're, we're very blessed to have a long life cycle of success, but it won't always be that way. We're very aware of, we just want to maintain that standard as long as possible. And then at some point in time, it will slow down. And hopefully we've been, you know, a pillar of the neighborhood and pe the new people that move in will continue to continue to come. Great. I love the neighborhood emphasis, which is really important. Any other questions? Um, do we have something back there? I'm just busting. I just happen to know a few back there. I'm just busting their balls. So how is it that <laughs> how is it that you build community? You know, you've become enormously popular. What was it? Social media? What was it that allowed you? You know, I know you're just going to say quality, just the quality of my food. But but usually most restaurateurs have to take active steps to build communities. Did you take any? Um, I actually live in the area that we do business, so uh -huh. I live on 8th and H. I've always lived on H Street. Um, I'm like Mr. Rogers walking down the street. Um, and uh, we've been active in trying to get other businesses to come to our neighborhood. Ah. Um, another part of being a community is just, um, you know, not leaving um, and continue to build more businesses there or um, facilitate other people to build businesses there. And also it's just engaging with what's the reality of that area is, which is it's, um, you know, it's gentrifying, it's changing. How do you find the right balance? Um, where do I play a role in that between the people that used to live there and the people that are moving in? And how can we make sure that it still retains some sense of culture um, without it feeling like 14th Street or, you know, um, places where they just kind of turn into these? Not to name names. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> of other places. But you're building an example. Negotiating the territory between dream and reality is something you're obviously doing brilliantly. It's something we've been discussing all morning. And it was great to hear you talk about this. And we're all going to line up for ramen, as I hope you will line up right now to dip some cucumbers in a wonderfully comp complex sauce that is worth the trip. So come up and get it. And thank yeah. you very no, much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Corby. Yes, come up. And as I, as I say goodbye, first of all, I want to thank this crowd um, for sticking around. It's been a wonderful and long morning, and it was a beautiful, hunger-inducing end. Um, and number two, I have one request before you go, which is, um, 
If you would fill out the comment forms that you have, um, either uh, sitting on your chairs or you will get an email from me momentarily. I want to thank um, all of our guests. Thank you, Eric. Um, I want to thank all of our moderators. I want to thank especially you, the audience. And I want to thank Elan uh, Elanco and, and Nestle for supporting this day. And we hope to see you back again soon. Who's serving the food? Oh, it's at the register. Oh, I'm wrong. It's not here. It's at the register. So as you leave, you will get food. Thank you to you, a wonderful audience.